Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Consolo, and I am a partner at Seacrest Wardle, practicing out of our Troy location. I'd like to welcome you to our next presentation on our Premises Liability webinar series. Today, I'll be discussing insurance and indemnity issues. This will be a nuts and bolts primer on when and under what circumstances your insurance may owe indemnity or are owed indemnity when you should tender the defense and when you should and should not accept tenders. All these issues will have a drastic effect on the pending claims and the outcome of your case. Before we begin, I want to identify the two types of indemnity. The first is contractual indemnity, which is the focus of today's presentation. The second is less common, but I wanted to make you aware of it, and that is called common law indemnity. So let's move into why you all are here. When dealing with indemnity clauses, you must first realize that it's quite possible that you own indemnity even if you're insured was not at fault or was just a little at fault. An indemnity clause requires you to throw out all rational thoughts and experiences that you have when determining fault in the apportionment of liability. I understand that this may be difficult to wrap your head around, but you need to start thinking outside the fault oriented world we live in day in and day out. For the most part, your primary focus should be on the language of the contractual provision. I look at indemnity clauses as contractual provisions that transfer risk and fault from one party to another. However, the legal definition set forth by our Michigan Court of Appeals is an indemnity contract creates a direct primary liability between the indemnitor and the indemnity that is original and independent of any other obligation. When reviewing the contracts, remember that the contract may not have a specific provision labeled indemnity. However, the provision may be worked into other language within the contract. So be on the lookout for clauses that say, for the benefit of, or shall defend or hold harmless. Let's discuss the steps that we need to take after reviewing an indemnity clause. But before we move on, I wanted to remind you again that when dealing with indemnity provisions, forget about fault and fairness because they do not exist. So after identifying that your contract involves an indemnity provision, this is the point where you need to make a strategic decision that may determine the ultimate outcome of the claim. First, let's talk about tendering the defense of your insured. I'm going to use an analogy here, and since I play hockey myself and I spend most of my, if not all of my free time in a hockey rink at my son's games, I'm going to use a hockey analogy. Tendering the defense of your insured is the point in which the puck is shot and you are the goalie. So it's up to you to determine whether or not to stop the claim from going any further. Generally, you can tender the defense of your insured through a letter to the indemnifying party stating that the claims and how those claims fall under the provision and indemnification clause in the contract. At that point, the other side can either accept or reject the claim. If they accept, you will need to still evaluate the claims and liability so as to further protect the insured. For example, the claimed amount may exceed the available coverage and assets that the indemnifying party has, so the claimant may be still looking to your insured for some amount of money. If they reject or ignore your claim, then you may file a cross-claim if they are in the case. If they are not in the case, you may file a third-party complaint seeking indemnification. If another party is seeking indemnity against your insured, you'll still need to evaluate the claims being made in the indemnification provision as we previously discussed. This time, you'll be looking to see if there are any conditions that trigger indemnity and if those conditions are met. For example, the contract may state that your client shall indemnify and hold harmless the indemnity if for any and all losses for negligence. While the claimant may not be bringing a negligence claim, and they could only be asserting merely a breach of contract claim against your insured. If that's the case, you may not owe indemnity. Another example is that the condition set forth in the indemnification provision may not be met until there is a judgment. Accepting a tender before judgment would be premature. However, there could be strategic reasons as to why you would conditionally accept the tender because in a scenario where it is premature, 
you would not want the other party simply not defending the claim as vigorously as they normally would because they know their client is going to be indemnified by your client. There may also be other conditions that you must be timely notified in writing to give you an opportunity to cooperate with the defense. If that writing is not met, then the condition may be that you do not owe indemnity. When reading through indemnity for provisions or clauses, keep in mind that these provisions are to be construed in the same fashion as other contracts. The same general rules apply. Indemnity contracts should be construed to ascertain and give effect to the intentions of the parties and are interpreted to give reasonable meaning to all of its provisions. That means you just have to read the contract in accordance with the indemnification provision to make sure it all makes sense, as opposed to solely just looking at the indemnity provision. Therefore, in order to properly evaluate indemnification claims, you again must thoroughly analyze the entire contract and not just the indemnification language. Another matter to look into is whether or not the tender is time barred. In Michigan, you have six years to bring the claim for indemnification. However, the contract may limit this period, or there could be other issues that arise, such as the one we previously discussed regarding timely or written notice. The last item that I'm going to discuss with you today is Michigan specific. And I understand that you may be practicing or having claims outside the state of Michigan. However, there could be similar type statutes in those states as well. However, I'm just going to focus strictly on the Michigan one today. This particular statute that I'll be briefly discussing is MCL 691.991. The statute precludes indemnification in favor of an indemnity who is solely negligent in connection with a contract for the repair or maintenance of a building, regardless of what the indemnification clause says, indemnification in favor of an indemnity who is solely negligent in connection with when a contract for the repair or maintenance of the building. Additionally, exculpatory clauses in residential leases that negate a landlord's statutory duties are unenforceable because they violate public policy. The case that discusses this is Wenzel versus Feldstein. However, in these type of cases, the comparative negligence of the party it still counts in determining the issue of sole negligence of that indemnity. I know we covered a decent amount here, but I just wanted to give you the nuts and bolts primers on dealing with indemnification contracts. If you have any questions or concerns or follow-up issues regarding the interpretation or analyzing indemnification clauses, you may contact me via email or through my direct dial at 248-539-2822. Again, I appreciate you attending and I hope that you learned something new today about indemnification clauses and how to properly evaluate those. Thank you.